Most of what I do on an average week is work with graduate student clinicians um, in AAC classes and in AAC clinics. I do two days a week of clinical work. Um, for a number of years, for a good number of years actually, I ran an AAC preschool. And so a lot of what we will be talking about today kind of got shaped by the experience of spending an awful lot of time um, with young children ages three through six, who went a little bit higher than we should have perhaps, but um, young children who came into this preschool with very little, if any at all, functional speech. And they were kids with a variety of disorders and conditions that w resulted in their severe speech impairments. Um, and many of those were individuals with autism. Um, so what we're going to talk about today um, is really a curricular approach that we came up with for addressing the core vocabulary and core language needs um, of these kids. And, you know, I just want to talk for a minute about kind of how we even came to the whole idea of getting to uh, a curricular process. And it was really because of kids, of course. Um, you know, the unending stream of phone calls that you get from, you know, parents who are desperate and scared um, trying to figure out what the next steps are going to be for their kids. Um, too many conversations with speech language pathologists who are ve were very overwhelmed and frustrated taking these kids for the first time and feeling that burden of helping them to develop their first language structure. And of teachers who are very, very burdened with um, so many competing priorities and a lot of debates with administrators who were resigned and frustrated and sometimes enthusiastic, but um, also you know, um, you know, dealing with many, many pressures on them. So we got here because too many kids um, that we were working with were entering kindergarten without you know, a good foundation of speech and language skills. And many of those, like these kids, have autism. So the phone calls, the conversations, the discussions uh, were seemingly unending. And I'm sure it's true in many places. Um, but at some point, we found that we just couldn't deal with these as individual situations anymore. Um, it just wasn't getting us the outcomes that we needed. And we started to do larger scale projects, um, both in our th tri-county um, area, but also um, because we have a very active distance and online program in other areas of the country as, as well. Um, and that helped somewhat. It did, uh, but it didn't help enough. Um, we spent a lot of time asking ourselves, you know, this question, how can it be that as a field of AAC, we have come so far in knowing how to help kids with complex communication needs become more effective communicators. How can it be that we know so much and yet so many kids are going to kindergarten without a good foundation of language skills? So what you're going to see today is our application of some of the research that you know has been done all around the world put into you know a very applied situation that um, we hope will be um, replicable. So as we thought about that wide gap that we saw on that last screen about what we know works or at least shows promise and what was happening in real homes and real preschools and real elementary schools to real kids, uh, we started to talk to um, families and professionals around the country who weren't implementing the supports that we know to be effective for these kids. And we started to talk to them about why that was. What was keeping them from accessing, from you know, implementing these things. Um, and the things that emerged were not so much um, the lack of basic information. And for an AAC person who's been around a very long time, that's a good thing, right? Because for a long time, we were just talking about the basics. We were arguing with insurance companies who were saying, oh, this is still experimental, you know. Um, so the, that, that, in some respects, was good news. But what they were really talking about um, were um, more the lack of more specific guidelines of how to apply the general information. And then um, also, believe it or not, something as simple as encouragement. Right? Some of the social-emotional sort of dynamics were some of the biggest obstacles. So um, they told us, for example, that they often felt very unsuccessful. 
Um, and that embarrassed them. Um, the drive to not look incompetent from in front of other people is very, very strong. And so a lot of the times the way they dealt with it was just kind of blocking it out and doing more of what they did know rather than venturing into the things that they thought they knew but didn't have enough confidence to try. Um, so we started to think about what we could do um, that was different because for many years we had been doing all the things that Pat does and many other people do, um, you know, to the extent that we can as a teaching university do a little bit of research, but certainly use the research that's out there um, in our own clinical work. You know, we do a fair amount of writing, um, workshop presentation, conference presentations, online things. We try to do all of that, um, but it still wasn't enough. And so we started to think about what other things could we do. Um, and as we did that, it led us to some things we'd never imagined that we would do, um, primarily social media. And um, social media, who me? Uh, it, um, it, well, yes, it was being used extensively by educational technology people, and they seemed to be generating a very enthusiastic following of supporters who were excited about the changes that they were putting into place, and there was this energy building uh, because of that. But, um, you know, uh, it was not, and is still not, a natural fit for us. Uh, we challenged ourselves to learn about things like hashtags, and professional learning networks online and Twitter chats and Facebook groups and blogging and digital curation and all of that. Um, and it still feels very unnatural and very uncomfortable, but we have jumped in with both feet. Um, we share, we connect, we learn from other professionals who are trying to that narrow the same gap that we are. Um, if only for, you know, a couple of clients on their caseload, kids that they see in their schools. And that has been a very transformative experience for us. The other something new that we ended up trying was uh, with a different colleague of mine, Lori Wise, um, and she's a special educator, and that is really our topic for today. So what Lori and I did uh, together is kind of talk about and explore some of the characteristics of interventions that do seem to be getting implemented <laughs> um, throughout you know, the different places that we visited. Um, so things like PECs for communication, Right, the four blocks literacy model for K-12 education, um, those seem to be getting you know implemented fairly well, and so you know we what we ended up with was something that had some of the elements of that, um, most notably kind of a rhythm to them and a predictable structure. We developed this kind of curricular approach that we have been, you know, has been kind of in progress over the last couple of years. Um, and we ended up with that curricular approach because it gives you an opportunity to do things systematically. Um, and of course, we were interested in, in core language and core vocabulary. And later on, I'll talk more about why we chose that as our focus. Um, but we ended up doing something to teach core vocabulary in the context of literacy activities. We chose literacy activities because they're so crucial to school success as they grow, these children grow, and because teams are facing increasing pressures, um, at least where we live, uh, for you know more academics at the preschool level. We had a full set of specs that we wanted to try to address as we did this. We wanted to focus on the core vocabulary. Um, we wanted lots and lots of opportunities for practice. Um, one of the things that um, all of the kids that we were seeing, whether they were kids with physical disabilities or kids on the autism spectrum or kids with other their developmental disabilities, one thing they all have in common is that they need frequent practice with whatever new thing they're learning in order for it to take. We also wanted activities that would fit um, a whole range of ability levels because in preschools like this you do have a huge variety in terms of the kids. So we would literally get kids who um, not only had they never been away from family before, but I've had some kids who came to us at three years old who had never not been held. So they had always been in the lap of an abuelita or a tia or, or a sibling. Um, and so you have a kid who is just dealing with not sitting on somebody's body <laughs> all the way to a kid who is communicating and speaking um, but not maybe um, as functionally as they could be or maybe not with as much generative language and maybe more echolalia and that sort of thing. So you have this huge range of individuals and we wanted to be able to accommodate all of them. 
Uh, we also wanted to be able to accommodate a wide range of AAC tools and strategies. Um, we love technology and we love to challenge ourselves to learn the newest and the latest. Um, but uh, my commitment always to my graduate students is to teach them enough to teach language with nothing more than a pencil and a paper. <laughs> Um, uh, and I think we have to be prepared because the digital divide, at least in our country, is so wide to be able to address um, things you know, that are very, very low cost. Um, we wanted to be able to do both group and individual activities. Um, and for implementation purposes, we really wanted it to be very feasible. We wanted it to be easy on the staff as easy as it can be working with these kids and teaching real language um, and real literacy skills. Uh, but we wanted, um, we had that as, as a goal for the program that we were developing. And then the last piece is we wanted some family involvement. Again, that can be really, really um, wide ranging. In our area, you can have preschools where uh, the parents and the teachers almost never connect. Um, they may only see each other um, at IEP meetings or at um, back to school meetings, and then you have other um, families who are, you know, in the preschool for a little part of the day each and every day. So those were kind of the parameters that we set for ourselves as we set out to do this. And we ended up with something called teaching early language and literacy through multimodal expression. Essentially, um, we are teaching uh, four to six um, core words for um, each book that we address and a special letter that we focus for each book and those repeated reading. Um, so we stay with each book for, for two weeks um, and I'll walk you through the different things. Everybody says, oh, how could you stay with a book for two weeks? But um, when kids are first learning language, um, when all of this is new to them, when they may come from a home where books are not lying around and they don't see their parents reading even a newspaper, um, then the repeated reading of the same book uh, can be very be beneficial. But the key thing is that the vocabulary and language teaching um, um, you know, happens all day long. Now in most of the preschools that we visited or, or work in, there, um, there was not necessarily a curriculum presence. <laughs> there may have been one that was handed down in that um, educational system, but you didn't really see it in evidence. Um, and in some places, there was no curriculum at all. Um, and so uh, there were plenty of thematic units, which you know, um, you know, were really good and interesting in some ways. But you really didn't get the sense that um, one thing built on what came before it and added up to something you know more significant at the end. Um, each unit, in some case some cases each week or each day stood on its own. And while as you watch the kids they seem to be very engaged, you didn't always get the sense that the skills were sort of cumulative. Um, so from the beginning we wanted to develop a predictable structure to what we did to um, you know, give the teachers and the aides who are supporting these kids um, some level of predictability so that they could get used to how to do this and then make it their own, modify it, take bits and pieces um, as they move forward. Um, so these procedures really evolved with the input from a few teachers um, over the over the years, um, but we ended up with kind of a 10-day sequence for shared reading a 10-day sequence for shared writing, um, and then a lot of different kind of what we call infusion activities that get done all throughout um, their time. And, and I'll talk more in detail kind of about this, but you know, the, the predictable structure um, around the repeated reading of storybooks um, turned out to be um, a good call on our part. And the reason that I knew it was a good call is when we got through all the books we had made plans for and they could do it well with books that were of their own choosing with very little drops in fidelity, um, then you know we got a sense that some of these things that we put into place that weren't always a natural fit for us um, you know, uh, were making sense to them. So 10 shared reading lessons and then 10 shared writing lessons. Um, we got a little bit of pushback on why you would do writing with such little kids. Um, and um, we use predictable chart writing, which is a very tiny subset of what you could do in shared writing. But um, for our purposes, uh, we were interested in doing some writing for a number of reasons. First of all, out of the recognition that not all these 
kids come from families where they see adults, right? But mostly because it takes them longer to learn anything than it does their peers. So if they're getting to kindergarten and they don't have a head start on some of this stuff, it's just not going to be good. They're only going to fall further behind. And that gap that we were trying so hard to hold constant and narrow is only going to widen for them. Um, and then um, infusion activities is just kind of our term for all of the different things that happen in a normal preschool um, that uh, we could build in core vocabulary teaching. And then um, in terms of the parent piece, we um, really, that is mostly sort of an informative piece. It's not the families coming into the preschool because we really don't have control over that. And while I did in, in the little preschool that I ran, it wouldn't be sustainable as you know it went on to other preschools. And so um, what we ended up doing was sharing a lot of information. So with every book, that uh, we work on, there's information that goes home to the families every week that shares a little bit of what is happening in the classroom, what words we're focusing on, what letters we're focusing on, um, some activities for them to do, and then also some skill building. You know, um, it's, it's a new journey for them as it is for their children. I wanted to come back to why focus on core vocabulary. Um, when we first started out this process um, a number of years ago, uh, it wasn't a hot topic the way it seems to be, at least in the states here these days, you're hearing a lot more about core language and core vocabulary. Um, but it certainly was not the case when we began to think about this. Um, we chose core language because, by their nature, these are high-frequency words. They are words that you and I use all the time, and these little kids, you know, if they were able to speak, um, they would be using them as well. And so for our purposes, that gave us a lot of opportunity to um, do the kind of teaching that would help us help them generalize it to any different kind of activity that would happen, you know, either you know in the school or at home. Um, so we really wanted something with that potential for generalization. And we also wanted something that would give us a good foundation for uh, further language development. So for example, we wanted um, you know, words from a bunch of different word classes so that we could make sentence building a lot easier. We wanted certain kinds of descriptors that would allow us to branch off and have other words for those descriptors. So good can be awesome and terrific. Once you know what good is, you can do some fast mapping onto stuff like that. Um, but I would say one of the big reasons um, was, was really that final bullet point. Um, this is the area where teachers and SLPs tell us they struggle. Um, you know, they do fairly well with activity-specific vocabulary, right? So if they're doing bubbles with a three-year-old, right, it's not hard for them to figure out how to teach pop and blow and bubbles, right, and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's a lot harder for them to teach pronouns, to teach mental verbs like no, K-N-O-W, to teach, you know, conjunctions like and, right? So that's really where they were telling us that they were struggling. When we looked at which core words uh, we were going to um, choose, of course, you know, we went to the literature and looked. There's not a ton of, of research out there, uh, but there is some. And so we looked at that and also at the scholarship and, and the work from some of the master clinicians in the AAC field in this area, um, but also kind of used other things to inform the work. We didn't strictly follow um, any of the core word published lists that are out there, nor did we strictly follow any developmental pattern. We put a lot of things together and pulled into in a very eclectic manner things that seemed to work uh, for the purposes that we were thinking about. Um, so we wanted a lot of opportunities for frequent use in the classroom, of course, um, and that meant that we had to have authentic teacher input. Um, and so there was a lot of compromise um, and negotiation. Um, I, in the end, didn't get the core word list that I would have wanted had I written that chapter by myself. But that's what, you know, um, collaboration and compromise is, right? And if I can only teach that to my government. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so, so anyway, there was, there was a lot of good and give and take there. And one area that I would say there was some give and take was um, some of those words that the teachers felt were important because they used them in other teaching strategies. So for example, I never would have picked the word first, right? 
in, in my initial set. But they use first then boards, right? They do a lot of list making. They do story sequencing. So there are a lot of activities that they do where words like that are, you know, very salient. So um, in the end, we all could live with the final list that um, we came up with, but I wouldn't say that it was a speech-language pathologist dream. Um, but these are the kinds of words that we ended up teaching, um, some of them a lot more specific than others. And again, um, you know, we did f roughly four to six, introduced four to six new ones with each book. Um, We'll look more at how we represented those things, um, but because we wanted to be as inclusive as possible of different AAC systems, we have materials replicated in PCS, Pixons, um, Symbol Sticks, um, and now we're going to be using the Smarty symbols that are on a lot of the apps now. So if you're making an app and trying to buy symbols to go along with your AAC app, that's one that people are considering. And then we had, you know, graphic depiction of manual signs because a lot of these kids are learning at least a, a base of keyword signing. Um, so this would be, you know, would be one example of a sample core word board that a classroom might have used early in the process, um, and then um, you know building more complexity, you know, so that um, we can build on sort of uh, motor learning principles. We, you know, when you have you know just a small number, we still gave it enough space. We put it in its permanent home. Uh, and that way, as we fill in, they don't have to unlearn that, um, you know, where any particular thing is and find it in a new location. They can just, you know, build on what they knew. And, you know, that's a mistake, I think, AAC, speaking for myself as an AAC interventionist, that's a bit, been a huge change. You know, um, when I first started teaching AAC, um, you know, we weren't as, co you know, cognizant of some of these motor learning principles. And we did, I think, a lot of harm by, you know, not intentionally, of course, but by, you know, having situations where kids had to unlearn what we had just taught them as the system grew uh, because, you know, we were making space for new vocabulary. Um, and we tried to make a different mistake this time. Um, the teachers played around with a lot of different ways of, you know, uh, organizing core vocabulary. So here's um, a, a, a two different core language boards in this particular um, scenario. Um, the ones along the top are static. Okay, every um, board that they make has that set of kind of social kinds of things there. And then on the left-hand side, those are static. And the things on the right um, change. And so they, you know, in, in this particular um, group that was working on this, they wanted um, all of the preschools in their area to have a consistent format for their communication boards. So we tried to, you know, just, um, you know, go with the different things that were out there in the communities and, and you know, uh, kind of fit into that. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, we talked about the, the core words and selecting those. I want to talk a little bit about how we selected books. Um, we started out looking at um, some of the early leveled readers that are there. Um, we discarded those for a number of reasons. Um, we wanted books that were very predictable and had uh, repetitive sentences. That's always kind of you know, engaging and important for little ones, but when you are learning AEC systems, it becomes that much more important because of the motor planning demands uh, for some of these kids. Um, you know, they need a little bit of extra time in you know, formulating responses, and um, so that was one thing we looked at. We wanted pictures that support the text, um, not too much print, um, um, for the page. We did experiment with one of the books of kind of rewriting the text a little bit, um, but for the most part, we wanted teachers to be able to use the text that was on there. And also interesting and appealing to kids. And I know that sounds like a no-brainer, but a lot of stuff that's out there for teaching early literacy, it's like very dull, <laughs> very boring. It's like, you know, you can't even really do any prediction. Like if you're doing a picture walk, you can't even do a prediction because there's like not any storyline that anybody would care about. <laughs> so, so, you know, we didn't go in that direction. Um, we did decide that we wanted books that are readily accessible um, to families and to teachers so that you could, you know, probably 
probably find them in your local library, in your school library, that you could, you know, get them on Amazon, where everybody goes these days. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, teacher preference factored a lot in there as well. Um, we wanted to be able to do a lot of follow-up activities that fit in with the books. It wasn't a major consideration, but it was something we thought about. And, of course, a lot of opportunities for um, core vocabulary practice. So um, it's harder than you might think um, looking for books that will help you make good use, give you lots of opportunities to say particular core words. Um, but that, of course, is paramount. So we ended up you know, with trade books that um, people can find anywhere. Um, this was the set. We, I think we ended up with um, 11, a warm-up book, and then 10 books that um, we presented new words in. Of course, we had to start with Brown Bear, um, and that was intentional because, uh, you know, remember that one of the reasons we came to this is that teachers and speech-language pathologists were saying they weren't feeling competent. They weren't feeling like they could make differences in the communication abilities of these kids. So we were very cognizant of starting with things that felt familiar, and because they can all say this book in their sleep, <laughs> we thought that that was a great place to start. And so, you know, in starting with that, um, you know, we kind of introduce them as we walk through all of the activities with almost like a light version of all of the different procedures that they'll go through. Um, so that, along with the fact that it was a really familiar book to them, um, allowed them to, you know, kind of get their feet on the ground with some of this before, you know, they moved on to things that might um, be a little bit out of their comfort zone. So again, each book has a set of core words um, and a designated letter. Um, this is actually really kind of fun to do. One of the greatest joys is reading to children, and it was really fun getting to, to pick out some of these books. Um, but again, our focus is really on the vocabulary teaching. So in thinking about that vocabulary instruction and, and, and teaching you know, um, these words, um, we again, of course, went to the literature on vocabulary learning. And uh, you know the way that you know we learn and teach new words have a lot of different elements for these preschoolers. Um, you know we are you know modeling it, we are explaining it, we're giving them what passes for a definition, and that's not an easy thing to do when you're working with somebody whose receptive language level is very compromised. Any definition that you want to provide probably contains words <laughs> that they don't understand. Through all of that, um, one very important thing, and this is borne out in the literature, is that you have to have frequent productions for this stuff to take root, right? It's not, you know, vocabulary learning is only passive to a certain extent. They have to really be saying it, using it, in order for, it, you know, it to become meaningful to them and be a part of their repertoire. Um, so these are ways we typically um, do vocabulary instruction. Um, now try some of that with um, you know the core words that we were talking about, right? So uh, you know it may be you know relatively easy to do it with some kinds of words, but it's very hard to define a word like have, right? Or give an experiential you know play experience with some of these words. So the things that they were used to doing aren't necessarily a good fit for these core words. But high rates of production are going to continue to be sort of the cornerstone of getting them to really understand and be able to use these words. Some of the uh, core words that we have, they will work pretty well with some of the typical ways of um, you know, teaching vocabulary. Um, but it, again, it can be very hard to do an experiential or a play activity around a word like and or have. Um, and so uh, the, one of the reasons that we did things the way we did it was to sort of um, circumvent some of those challenges. So all of the children um, who are participating in this got those four to six um, new words with every book. Um, and some children got an additional couple of words, maybe two or four um, additional words. Um, and generally that happened in one of two situations. One is when the student came in with a higher language level to begin with, obviously. Um, but then the second was uh, a lot of times in the preschools that we visited, um, these kids were staying there multiple years. 
right? So they didn't, you know, even though, you know, they had been there as a three-year-old, they were coming back as a four-year-old and maybe again as a five-year-old if they didn't seem ready, you know, to go on to kindergarten. Um, so for those guys, so that they weren't revisiting exactly the same thing all the time, we added some new words. And another piece that um, we did that seems like a no-brainer is um, kind of a follow-along process. You know, as we moved on to new words, it was really important for us to continue to highlight and utilize and elicit the words that we had previously taught. Um, in most places that we visited, and um, this is true for K-12 education for sure in the States, um, we don't have that common sense approach to things. You know, uh, we teach a kids a set of vocabulary, you know, and then at the end of the week we get a sense of who knows what, um, but it doesn't matter in a way because everybody gets the new set the following Monday. <laughs> so I don't even know why we gave you that test on Friday. Um, so, you know, it was very important for us um, because we had such a wide range of kids. We knew that some of these kids, because they came to us as pre-intentional communicators, Right? They were not sending signals on purpose. We knew they were not going to be kids who acquired all these core words at the, you know, by the end of the school year. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we kept hitting the ones that we had addressed previously rather than just moved on to completely new sets. Um, and in all cases, those, those were shared with families. All right, so, so I'd like to uh, maybe walk us through what shared reading looks like. Uh, it takes many iterations, and I put a couple of slides um, in here um, about shared reading in general, because not everybody is familiar with it. But in general, with shared reading, uh, the teacher or the therapist explicitly models strategies and skills that proficient readers use. So when you see it in a K-12 environment, that's kind of what it looks like. So they might do, you know, a particular mini lesson on a certain thing, and then they're going to be modeling um, that. And then together, the teacher or the therapist and the kids, they read together, they discuss what they're reading, they talk about it and enjoy the text, and at all times the kids can see um, what the teacher or the therapist is reading. So it's a little different than a read aloud, you know, where kids aren't necessarily watching what their teacher um, or therapist is looking at. And there's lots and lots of different um, reasons why uh, teachers and therapists use shared reading. Um, teaches them all sorts of different things, and many of these were, you know, important to our kids. Um, but the real reason that we were using it, shared reading was not, you know, for those reasons is the primary um, thrust, but but for the language teaching. We were really using the literacy activities as the vehicle, as the context um, for the language teaching. And as it turns out, that is a good thing because now with the Common Core State Standards in America at least, you know, um, you know, teachers are getting more pressure than ever to use the general ed curriculum um, as the base for um, all of their interventions um, um, and therapists, the speech language pathologists as well. We had that mandate before but it was, it's certainly getting operationalized a lot more now. So shared reading is really the practice, the, the context for this core vocabulary practice. Um, we have these little characters here who represent different things in the curriculum and things like that, um, but we're really doing this shared re reading and kind of manipulating the process a little bit to give that core vocabulary practice. Most of the kids that came in, um, you know, obviously at the preschool stage, are very much at this emergent literacy level. And we wanted to be using this also as a format for teaching, you know, just basic concepts of print, uh, building, you know, um, the idea that pictures are different than print. The two have meaning, but they are different. They could be related, but possibly not. Um, and as they grew, you know, um, focusing on some of these other things as well. There's so many things that can be accomplished through the shared reading. Um, in addition to the core vocabulary practice, the things that are, that are bold-faced are really the ones that we found to be, you know, the most um, important for this population. You know, getting them to see themselves almost as readers or participating as reading, you know, in reading is a big step for a lot of these guys. Um, you know, they are dealing with all sorts of issues and, you know, we have to start them when they're little to be getting comfortable with books because when they get to kindergarten and first grade, you know, that's going to be an expectation and that train is leaving the station with them or without them. 
Um, so getting them that experience of reading alongside their peers, getting them the experience of knowing how they can contribute in that activity, even though they may not understand as much as the little one sitting next to them, they still have a role and a contribution. Um, from a language perspective, making those connections between the book and what's happening in the story and the pictures and the illustrations in the text and what they know. Um, so activating their background knowledge, relating it to um, things that are going on in their homes, in their schools, uh, in their you know day-to-day uh, -day lives, uh, is really, really um, turned out to be very important for these kids because they're not. Most of them are not kids that connect those dots, right? They don't see a picture of a dog and think, "Oh, that looks like my dog." Whereas if you go to other kinds of preschools, that's exactly what they think. Can I tell you about my dog? Right? So we have to kind of work to, to sort of help them retrieve what they already know about dogs because they have one and what they eat and what they do. And that allows us you know, to kind of you know, move forward with um, not just that story, but also their, their language comprehension in general. As they move on to kindergarten then, you know, uh, this approach has allowed us to, um, you know, give them some of the foundational skills that will work for them there. Um, they have a lot more familiarity with, you know, a reading activity, what the expectations are, and that's a huge thing for a lot of the kids that we serve, you know, with autism. You know, um, it's not so much learning the specific skill that the activity is designed to teach as it was learning how to participate in that activity. So for, you know, so if you're running a shared reading activity with a group of kids and that kid can't stay in a group, <laughs> you know, you have to tackle that first <laughs> simultaneously. This was um, something important in our community because they were doing a lot of individual interventions with kids. And that was great for skill building, right? But these kids were then falling apart when they went into group situations and they had to listen to other people talk. They had to wait their turn. And um, so, you know, some of these things really just kind of gave them the experience of sort of how to participate, you know, in those kinds of learning experiences. So this is just an example of, you know, just kind of pulled randomly from um, one of the uh, days of shared reading. So this is um, uh, the second book, and it's a, a lesson five. So it began with, uh, you can see we've kind of, uh, you know, given this a very kind of predictable structure. There's a pre-reading activity, there's a part where we obviously read the book, and then there's a follow-up activity. Um, and um, we begin with a picture walk through the book in days one and two. That usually takes two days because kids at this level, you just can't get through a whole book. Um, you know, they just don't, you know, obviously if he's not sitting in a group, he's not going to sit in a group for, you know, a half an hour. You know, it has to be a kind of short and easy group. Um, and so, you know, we kind of build their skills over time, but they are doing different things with it each and every day. So it goes from a picture walk, and every day we set the purpose for why we are reading, and we kind of read for that, through that book um, with that purpose in mind. Setting the stage, um, the, one thing that the teachers brought to us is they needed that these, gr these group activities to start with some kind of unifying activity. So a song starts every activity. That, that really came from the teachers and they said we've got to wake them up and get those whole bodies moving and focused. And so we start with that. Um, then they do some review of core, core vocabulary. And um, this was a big stretch for me as a speech language pathologist working with kids on the spectrum and other kids. You're so based in doing everything in a meaningful context, right? Doing everything in a, you know, a context that supports the meaning of that word. One of the things that we did that's outside of that um, is a lot of choral responding with some of these words to get them more fluent in saying them, producing them, um, getting familiar with them. So it's not where we start out um, in teaching those words, but in every activity as we're warming up, we almost do sort of like if you're going to the gym and you might stretch before you go do your circuit. Right? So we you know, go through and we look at the words that we're going to be talking about and we say those together. 
and it allows them to find them in their AEC systems more quickly. It gives them those added productions that they need. For some of our kids, it's a motor response that they need to learn. Um, but it was a real stretch for me as a speech-language pathologist to do anything related to vocabulary learning that wasn't embedded in a context. So. Um, we did that planfully for specific reasons. Um, of course, most of what happens with the vocabulary teaching is, with, is contextually based. So we do the, um, some preparatory work, then we go through and read um, that book for whatever purpose was established. Um, and then there's usually a follow-up activity. So um, in this case, they were reading, you know, to do some looking at the characters and, and uh, creating a poster on um, who is in it. We actually scripted this out for the therapists or the teachers. Um, we didn't intend to do that, um, but uh, when we tried it the first few times, the jet, even though we thought we were being pretty specific, um, we weren't being specific enough. And so we scripted it out. Uh, the teachers certainly don't have to use the script, but it is there for them if they need to, you know, uh, get get familiar with it to to be start to get started. Um, and I would say probably as I kind of watch teachers through this process, they used the scripts a lot until they got to about book five, then they didn't need them. And that's fine. That's fine. They're, you know, it wasn't our first choice of doing it, but what we wanted to really um, ensure is that there was adequate um, focus on the core vocabulary and that the kids were getting a lot of experience hearing it and seeing it through the AEC system and that there were a frequent number of elicitation. So uh, how that actually gets operationalized depends on the individual classroom and what they're using. Um, we're seeing some classrooms now go to poster-sized communication boards, which is great. Um, if you have kids who are all on the same symbol system and you know things are organized the same way. Um, you know, if they're using their own speech generating devices or personal communication boards and books, then that's a, a role for the aid. And um, that's another thing that teachers sort of brought to this is that they wanted much more specific direction to be able to give the support personnel in those classrooms. And um, we, we resisted that, I think, initially, um, but we came to see the wisdom of it. Um, we tend not to like to tell people exactly what to do and yet give them the freedom to to you know, uh, make things happen in their own way. But they, I think that in the end, they really do appreciate knowing what the specific expectation is. Um, so um, you know, there's also a, you know, a specific role for the aid, and that aided language input is key. Um, let's see. So we tried to switch up the books um, quite a bit. Uh, we read with big books and little books. Um, sometimes uh, they did some follow-up individual reading with these using electronic books. Sometimes we use the PowerPoint versions of books in the whole lesson. Um, um, we found that the kids really began to anticipate the different ways in which they would see that story. And that kind of surprised us. We thought the story is the story. But they would look forward to having it on PowerPoint or having it on a mini book versus a big book. And uh, it just goes to show that you never know what they will gravitate toward. Because you know we wanted a wide range, um, we made sure that the books were switch accessible for those kids that have motor impairment. Um, by the way, we are getting a lot. We are seeing a lot more kids with autism who are duly diagnosed with other impairments. Um, so we are seeing kids diagnosed with spectrum and cerebral palsy, autism and Down syndrome, autism and Angelman's, mm -hmm. which took me a long time to get my head around. <laughs> Still kind of does. <laughs> um, so we're, get, we're seeing a lot more complex kids. Um, I'm not sure if they truly are more complex kids or we're recognizing the different complexities that these kids always had, but certainly kids that are coming with dual diagnoses. We also did a, a number of story-related songs, so making up stories that would go with the songs. Uh, we tried to make those you know, familiar tunes and things like that, um, but this was really helpful to um, show the teachers that um, the core language can be in anything. And so, you know, the, here the I Went Walking song that goes along with that book 
familiar tune and all of that, but you know, we built it around the core vocabulary. And as we, you know, as they would sing these, they would learn to pause them at certain times for the kids to say what they could say for that part of the song. Um, so they got some additional experience saying those core words. So these are just kind of some snippets of the the kinds of things you might um, see as you watched a, a, a you know vocabulary teaching experience using shared reading, um, using aid la language input to model as she's saying something like I like this song, you know, using technology of course in some cases to sing um, their songs, um, some of that choral responding for the, the vocabulary that had been introduced previously in a contextually relevant um, situation. Um, you know, if it was the purpose of that book to look for some of the special words before they read it that day, then, you know, she might engage them in doing that. Um, so these are just, you know, kind of snippets of the kinds of things that uh, you might see. And the key elements to making this all work really were that repeated reading um, where there was that aided language input and kids were seeing how these core vocabulary words were being produced in this context and then us just eliciting it over and over and over again um, both in and out of context. Um, and here are just a, a couple of screenshots um, just showing some of the technologies. Of course, the iPad has changed everything and so um, we're using those for songs and some core words. We tried to be very inclusive and use whatever the children came with. Even though we might have had one idea or another about the appropriateness of it, we tried to use it and build towards something more appropriate rather than, you know, be, you know, um, more confrontational and obstructive about it. So here's just an example of, you know, they may be reading for, you know, a character study and they, you know, um, would be using their core words to, you know, kind of build, uh, you know, a, a, po a little poster that they would then put in the classroom or take home, depending on how the teacher chose to do that. And these are just some examples, uh, you know, kind of showing things in... Um, uh, in practice, you can see here the aide who is helping out there has a little um, mini version of the symbol and the child is responding by saying it using his um, core word board and looks like he's pretty independent at this point. Just some examples of how visually the different teachers would do it and they certainly changed as they you know, got more invested in this and felt free to um, play with things. We did a lot with story sequencing um, as well. Um, so we wanted them to begin to look at stories in terms of how they are laid out um, for our core words, um, but to build those retelling skills and that it has a big emphasis as they get to school as well. This really just kind of helps them kind of lay out the plot structure and we used a lot of shared classroom communication devices to help with the retelling because the, at this level the kids aren't able to, you know, use the, the what little language they've acquired to do that and so a lot of it is pre-stored vocabulary that has been put into larger chunks, whether it's sentences or even a couple of sentences and then they learn to kind of sequence that through. Um, but they're getting the idea, they're learning to do that before there's language skills develop. So when the language skills do develop, right, they can put those two things together and hopefully, you know, that will benefit them rather than what had been happening and that is that those things like the story sequencing were waiting until the language skills kicked in and the gap just was widening and widening for a lot of these kids. So a lot of teachers um, do these kinds of story maps at the older grade levels and we pulled it down to the kindergarten um, pre-K level. Um, again, not that we expect the kids to sort of master these skills at this age, but we want to introduce them to the kinds of things that they are going to need to do um, you know, as they move forward. And although it's designed to build all of these things, um, our focus was really um, to do these, but as a way to practice um, that core vocabulary. Here's just an example of how very simple it can get. Um, so they had, um, you know, a story about a lunchbox surprise, and they're focusing on their core words and getting just more and more opportunities to um, say those words, you know, in different contexts. 
And again, the teachers, you know, um, have different ways of doing story retelling and story maps, and so we tried to provide enough support so that they could do it however, you know, worked best with the system that um, they had in place at that time. All right, so that's sort of the, the shared reading, ex, you know, a sequence in a nutshell. Um, the other big group activities that we did in a 10-day sequence was shared writing. Um, so in shared reading, of course, uh, you know, the focus was, you know, you've got some emergent readers using predictable text. Here we've got emergent writers, and we are going to be using these predictable charts. And I'm not by any means saying that this is the best way to do um, shared writing with this group, but for us it met a lot of the criteria that we had set out um, to do. Thank you.